This is the Brave New Coin Crypto Conversation, hosted by Andy Pickering. Hi everyone, Andy Pickering here. I'm your host and welcome to the Crypto Conversation, a Brave New Coin podcast where we talk to the people building the future in the Bitcoin, blockchain and cryptocurrency space. <laughs> My guest today is Sam Huber. Sam is the CEO and founder, I believe, of LandVault, an end-to-end -end metaverse solution for Web2 and Web3 experiences. Welcome to the show, Sam. Thank you for having me, Andy. It is a pleasure. Well, uh, just before we get into LandVault and learn all about it, Sam, let's do what we do at the beginning of the show. I would love it if you could please introduce yourself. Love to just hear a bit of your uh, professional story in the lead up uh, to founding Land Vault. And I know it was previously AdMix, I believe. But yeah, what's your story? Yeah, so uh, I have an engineering background. I studied uh, physics for a couple of years in uh, in Switzerland, which is uh, I'm, I'm half French, half Swiss. Um, always been interested in, you know, figuring out how things work. I had a big passion for uh, Formula One, still have. And so my idea was to study physics and then specialize into engineering and, and then eventually go to work in, in the Formula One industry. And this is what I ended up doing. So I my first job actually out of um, uni was working as an engine engineer for uh, Mercedes. At the time, you know, this was 2012, 2013. It was um, just before the new V6 era where Mercedes won for seven years straight. So we were basically just preparing for that. I was working really closely with Hamilton and uh, Button, who were both at the time driving for McLaren, who were supported by Mercedes from an engine point of view. So that was my first um, you know, job, which has nothing to do with gaming or the metaverse no um, but, it, but let's just let, let's just pa let's just pause there so though sam because uh i'm i'm like a, a reasonably uh enthusiastic formula one fan myself and um so uh just watched um the final race of the season yesterday which of course was uh won by max uh over at red bull and yeah bit of a, a harder year for mercedes this year but do you still mm -hmm. um, are you still a fan do you still still watch it sam yeah yeah still a fan for sure um you know going working there really made me um very loyal to to mercedes and of course just, you know knowing the team and everything um but i love i still love formula one i think uh, uh you know netflix done an amazing job at making it more of a thing when i yep. used to work there i was used to tell people i work in formula one it's not not a big deal especially in the us and now everyone knows about it so they've they've done a fantastic job there and you know i still go see some races i was at um monaco miami singapore um this year and i try to try to follow and and go and see the races when possible awesome awesome uh well hey that's cool i did not know that so um yeah fascinating that you were yeah an actual uh, <laughs> f1 engineer on the show nice i love it all right well um there you go Pick up, pick up the story from there, Sam. I mean, anything after F1, yeah, is almost less exciting. But hey, we're we're here to talk about the metaverse, so let's go. Uh, I think <laughs> I think it's exciting as well. No, yes. I mean, um, it was a, it was a very interesting, you know, job. Um, but I've I've always had the idea that I wanted to do my own thing. I wanted to create my own my own venture. You know, be, be in charge of my own destiny. And uh, as an engineer, you know, being one of 1000 working on something exciting but yet a, a small part of that i just felt that um it was you know something that um just uh something that i just couldn't pass so at the time i didn't really have a big idea of what i wanted to do um but i knew that um um, I could see that, you know, the, the gaming industry was growing. I could see that mobile was also uh, exploding 2013. I think we, we called it back then the year of mobile, where more and more people were spending time on, on their smartphones. So I saw a, a kind of an easy entry point for me to get into entrepreneurship, which was to build games. I didn't have, again, a, a grand vision at the time. I just thought, okay, this is, you know, uh, something that, can be done without a, a significant investment, right? You can build small games. You can assemble a team with a designer, a developer, and um, obviously this, this wouldn't be games that would be the you know the best games in the world. But at least it was a way to get a, a project started off the ground. And uh, for about two years, we were basically building mini games, um, monetizing those games. We were selling the code of those games on third-party code marketplaces and 
really learning about how content works, how to how to monetize, you know, games. And uh, one thing that was not stopping was the adoption and how many people were using our games, but also other games. I could really feel like we're the, the, the beginning of something. Um, and at the same time, you know, I, I remember being very frustrated with the tools that were avail available to us creators to monetize the games. Mainly we were forced to use terrible ad platforms the ones that you know force you to watch ads that take the entire screen and you can't skip the ad and you end up spending more time watching advertisement than actually playing the game. And I just felt like there must be a better way to make this work with a better user experience. And this is what led to the creation of AdMix, uh, which is a in-game advertising platform. So the idea is still to take the good parts of advertising, the fact that it powers free-to-play content, but by completely changing the way that users interact with it. So instead of being bombarded with ads that are intrusive and in your way, the idea was to integrate these brands directly with the content of the game. For example, a car could be actually modeled after a real car and branded. Or a simpler example would be that billboards around a stadium could have real time advertisement that would be targeted to the country where you are in. But as a player, you still play the game and it happens to be that there are some brands, you know, on the horizon or next to you or on your shirt. But this is a very different relation with advertising. It's not advertising per se. It's more of a brand experience. Yeah. And so we build the entire tech stack to make that happen. Got it. Got it. Yeah. And I can see, you know, you you worked with um yeah, big big brands, uh, McDonald's, Calvin Klein, and of course uh, Formula One to create these kind of premium, uh, premium experiences. So uh, that all makes sense, then, Sam. So how how then does that kind of um, pivot or, or evolve into, um, I suppose, more of the the metaverse space? And I I can see that you've been you describe yourself as buying a virtual land since twenty seventeen. So uh explain what you mean there yeah yeah so um basically the the company admix that i mentioned also started 2017 2018 and uh, became quite successful pretty quickly we onboarded a lot of games uh, at the peak we had 700 games on our platform and we raised close to 40 million dollars in in venture capital um bringing you know bringing an amazing team with us um and in parallel uh, i was very interested from very early in you know bitcoin and then ethereum and then you know the ico boom of 2017 where all these platforms like decentraland and so on started to issue metaverse land so i was in that space but very passively um, just making investments and, you know, making bets, but I couldn't see really a, a link between that and the company. And it's only last year, 2021, when, you know, we had so many, um, because of the NFT bull market and, and generally the, you know, the, 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 the space doing well, um, Facebook rebranding into meta, there's just a lot of things that happened that made, um, the metaverse become this buzzword and a lot of, our clients, these big brands that you mentioned, started to ask us about the metaverse. Can you take us into the metaverse? Because we already took them into gaming, which was a very new thing to do for a brand at the time. And they saw the metaverse as the next phase beyond that, the next generation of gaming almost. So they trusted us with that. And we saw a big opportunity, you know, as a, as a company that is building creator tools, I saw a big opportunity to do it in Web3 much bigger than doing it in web 2 so we we decided to pivot um as part of that was acquiring a studio that has the creative capabilities to build in the metaverse and then rebrand into land vaults and apply the technology that we had into the metaverse but that did mean to sunsetting the web 2 business which was a huge bet that we made that you know the even though the business was successful we were just on the back of our series b actually applying that and moving to the web three world would create bigger opportunities for us in the future. And so that's what we've done. And we haven't looked back since. Fantastic. Well, uh, describe then just people will be getting a sense of what land vault is, but, but talk, uh, just give us the, the high level summary of, of what land vault is and kind of a, maybe a, a sense of uh, the scale. It seems like you've got quite a, a big team and you've done quite a bit of work already, Sam. Yeah, yeah. So basically, we are a construction company, but 
in the metaverse. So we, we follow a real estate approach where we buy land, virtual land, but we buy land and then we develop the land. We build projects on top of it, which could be a, a building, a concert venue or a project for a brand. We have a whole team of about 120 creators, architects, builders, game mechanics, uh, you know, narrative developers and so on that are able to turn these empty spaces into something fun and engaging, a mini game, basically, that is hosted on those platforms, obviously, with the use of crypto and, and uh, you know, all the blockchain mechanics, because those platforms are powered by Web3. Um, and then we, the technology that Admix had, the legacy technology to do product placement and analytics and measurement is now plugged into those um environments as well so we're able to measure success and monetize those experiences directly from uh within the metaverse so we are really an end-to-end -end solution and our clients are big brands the same as before you know the the mastercard or the uh, l'oreal or red bull that are looking at entering the metaverse figuring out a new environment for them to connect with their customers and create new relationships and we are basically helping them along the way of finding the right land for them, renting it to them, uh, and then developing that experience that they want to build from A to Z and then help them monetize it. So that's been the, um, that's been the work. We've doubled in size this year globally from 100 to about close to 200 people, a little less than that. And uh, we've done also close to 200 projects, um, some of the largest brands all the way down to, you know, smaller NFT projects that also needed a presence in the metaverse. And we build mainly across Sandbox, Decentraland. We're looking at other platforms as well. It's like Somnium Space and Spatial um, with a big focus on, on Web3. Yeah, very nice, Sam. And yeah, I can see you did a, uh, a Decentraland Fashion Week. Um, so did Heineken... We're part of that, yeah. Oh, oh yeah, you're part of that. So um, I have to ask though, Sam, obviously, you know, last year was as you explained yourself, absolutely massive um, for Web3 and the metaverse. Um, metaverse went from kind of, uh, you know, an, an obscure uh, idea or reference in a, in a Neil Stevenson uh, book to, um, you know, mainstream awareness um, overnight, really. And of course, we had the, the massive NFT boom. Uh, but of course, this year is very different. Uh, crypto market is down in the dumps nft trading volume has uh, fallen away and i imagine there's you know slightly uh less buzz uh on the, on the metaverse front at the moment probably particularly from some of the you know the world's uh, biggest brands uh, how, how are you finding that space at the moment yeah, actually, we've, we've had continued growth. You know, we, we are seeing what you said. Um, it's true that in um, Q1, Q2, literally every brand wanted to get in the metaverse and quite often for the wrong reasons in the sense that they were looking after, they were, you know, looking at, you know, just FOMO and we need to be there, but we don't really know why, but we need to be there because our competitors are there. So that led to a lot of, you know, small activations, poor activations, um, putting the announcement ahead of the actual build, meaning that no one would ever use it. Um, and now, obviously, we're in a more quiet market. Mm -hmm. So a lot of the people that were here for the for the wrong reason or just for the for the headlines are gone. There's there's less headlines generally. Um, but you know, we've seen continued interest from big brands that now have a strategy around Web three in general, and the metaverse fits within that. This didn't happen in Q1, Q2. It was too early. Brands didn't have time to have a Web3 task force really coming up with the proper strategies for their brand to, to stay relevant in this new phase of the internet. Now we see that. So the projects that we have now, um, yes, there is less clutter, I would say, but the brands that are interested are genuinely interested to make a long-term impact and the projects are bigger and more substantial. It's not just let's buy land and announce it. We're talking about, okay, let's build this for the next six months and you know, let's create a story that relates to our other social media channels. So it's a lot more thought uh, through, which is great and actually helps us you know, navigate, navigate the noise. So you know, overall brands are looking at this as a new channel, like a new social media channel almost, a new place to reach their customers. And the fact that crypto prices is down is, is very secondary because it's never anyone's prime motivation to enter the metaverse. 
Sure. Well, uh, that all makes sense, Sam. I'd love you to just expand on that just slightly, like um, maybe use a kind of imaginary case study of a, you know, uh, maybe a a brand. It doesn't need to be like, you know, a McDonald's or a Coca-Cola, maybe it's kind of um, a a brand one or two levels down from that. If what would, what would their um, web three or metaverse strategy look like uh, across the next, you know, two, three years, do you think, what, what should they do? I think it should all come down to why they want to do this in the first place. Right. So the, the main reason of course is, You know, if you look at it on a five to 10 year window, it's about relevance, right? We are entering a a new phase of the internet, a new platform, which is the platform that this new generation that are now, you know, entering their teenage years and will soon be a big customer segment uh, are entering. Those people are called Generation Alpha. They're born in 2010 or beyond. So they're still, you know, young right now. But those kids were basically raised playing games instead of watching TV, right? They are using different media channels. They think about that differently. They're very friendly to crypto because, again, they were born with it. And so they are becoming this perfect citizens of the metaverse. They understand this natively, just like, you know, Generation Z understand TikTok and millennials understand the Internet better than the generations before. So this is happening again. And, you know, this time by 2025, that generation is going to be over 2 billion people. It's going to be the biggest customer segment on the planet. And so brands need to start being relevant today at the risk of being irrelevant to them tomorrow when they actually, that that audience actually has the purchasing power to buy their products. So we see the metaverse as an insurance against irrelevance within the next couple of years. And then the shorter term pitch is that this is a place where today you can start experimenting and you can already start building long sessions with your audience. We have you know, a brand that is a bank, um, meaning that you know, they, they're not like, a, I guess they don't have a super high affinity to their customers generally, it's more transactional. And the experience that we have built for them had a 29 minute session time. You know, it's, it's, it's an incredible amount of time to have a consumer basically trapped within your brand and where you can, you know, educate them about the brand, maybe sell them products or delight them with a great experience. This is very rare to have someone's attention for 29 minutes in the digital world. Only the metaverse enables that. So there are, you know, there are tangible points today for marketeers, for brands to use the metaverse to create this unique interaction, a bit like experiential marketing, but scaled because it's happening in a digital world. So there's really a lot of ways. And obviously we're still exploring and figuring out, you know, what could be the value proposition of all these different things, but there are already things that are emerging and engagement translating into purchase is one of the main reasons why brands should be in the metaverse today. Yes, yes, indeed. And talk talk about the what you call land. So this would be the uh, the land vault, uh, virtual land. And h- how does that work? So I, c- I see that you know, um, I suppose your your clients can either um, they can purchase land from you or they can rent uh, land. So what is this land? Yeah. Uh, how does that work? Right. So if you look at a platform like Sandbox or Decentraland or Somnium Space, which are the largest web three metaverse platforms, the way that they are, the platforms making money is by selling land and land is basically a fraction of the map. So imagine the whole map. So all the, 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 um, I guess, geography that this platform has developed. Uh, Imagine that they are breaking it down into small portions and each portion is a piece of land and you can acquire that piece of land, it's an NFT. So the land is unique and you are the unique owner of that land. The brand um, or whoever wants to develop on top of the land can then use tools that the platform provides to build a house, to build, you know, a castle, a stadium, whatever activation. And that's, that's what Land Vault basically does. So we acquire the asset and then we develop it like a property company would develop the raw land that they are buying somewhere. Um, But the beauty of that is Yes, there is an entry cost. You have to buy the land first 
And the land is obviously as an NFT, it is now traded on platforms like OpenSea. So it's a liquid market. And we've seen, you know, I bought land in 2017. It was about $50 for a parcel where you could build a full activation. And now it's about $15,000 per parcel. And it went up to 220 and it, it came down. And we were actually renting this back to brands who do not want to deal with actually buying an NFT. Sometimes they don't even know where they would host it. They don't have, you know, a company wallet address, for example. So we abstract all of that complexity by renting it, which is basically the right for a brand to enter the metaverse. They have to rent monthly from, from us uh, on top of land that we have, and then we help them develop the entire space. So um, I think what's interesting about that is the platform is selling land. So yes, they make money up front. But then in the case of Sandbox, for example, they only take a couple percent of the future revenue on top of that land. So yes, you have an entry cost, but after that, you know, you control your business model. Whereas if you compare with a company like Roblox, which is not Web3, so there's no concept of land, it's a metaverse platform, Roblox takes 75%, 72% of any purchases forever. So yes, you don't have an entry cost, you don't have to buy land, but you're constantly in that ref share with the platforms. So it's a different way, you know, to, to, for the platforms to monetize and for the platform to give you ownership of a part of the map that you are then free to develop and monetize. Yeah, fascinating. Let's finish off this part of the podcast, Sam, and then we will run you through the very famous crypto conversation hot take round just before we go to the break. Tell people where they should go if they are intrigued and want to learn a little bit more about LandVault. So landvault.io is our main website um, where you can see more about the project that we've done, the offering, and maybe how we can help you. And then you can connect with me directly on LinkedIn or Twitter, Sam Huber. Um, I share a lot of you know video um, explanation content about what it means to be in the metaverse, why it's relevant, the, the right question to ask, and uh, how you can also benefit from the growth of what we believe is the next phase of the internet. Awesome. Thank you for that. We will go to a very quick break and then we will be straight back with a very famous crypto conversation, Hot Take Ground. In today's crypto market, the team at Brave New Coin are the sector's leading builders of custom crypto indices. BNC's powerful indexing engine draws on Brave New Coin's premium data to calculate high frequency intraday and end of day indices for a wide range of index products. BNC's custom indices help you to gain exposure to the crypto assets class and track your performance against the market without having to become a stock picker. Not sure what you need? A Brave New Coin consultant can help you assess your requirements. Contact BNC today to find out more. All right, we are back and I'm with Sam Huber. Sam, of course, is the CEO and founder of LandVault an end-to-end -end metaverse solution. Uh, Sam, I'd like to finish each podcast with a quick round of rapid-fire crypto conversation hot takes. Are you up for it? Uh oh, let's see. I think so. <laughs> All right. Just uh, want quick kind of rapid-fire hot take style answers, Sam. No right or wrong way to do it. Question one for you is, uh, where would you say that you sit on the Bitcoin maximalist to multi-chain opportunist spectrum? Uh, more on the multi-chain side, definitely. Yeah, makes sense. All right, well, what would you say is your firmest conviction crypto opinion, Sam? I mean, I guess the firmest conviction is I, I do believe in uh, a future version of the internet that is powered by the blockchain. I see, I see that trend being pretty, um, you know, undeniable and... Uh, and, and pretty obvious that it's going to happen. The timing, I think, is uncertain, but I think the direction is clear and the momentum is, is clear as well. Yeah, well, Bill Gates famously said that we tend to overestimate what we can accomplish in two years and underestimate what we can accomplish in 10. So 10 years, long time, but yeah, Web3, Metaverse, what does it look like in 10 years' time then, Sam? I think we're going to have a almost a parallel version of the internet, you know, saying that the metaverse will replace the internet. Obviously, that won't be the case. Every media um, 
or solution generally is is just an add-on, right? We still listen to radio and and we still watch TV. It just doesn't grow as fast as it used to. So I think the the ultimate media for a lot of interaction that require uh, some level of experiential content will be on that layer, layer of metaverse where you get to own, you know, digital content and users can be owners in that new world instead of just being spectators. Um, so I think that's this is how, you know, I can see the metaverse shaping off and a lot of the content that we consume online will be in those immersive three dimensional worlds. Yes, indeed. All right. Well, flip side of that is uh, a quote by William Gibson, who, of course, said that the future is already here. It's just not evenly distributed. With that in mind, Sam, can you think of an example of the future being here right now, but most people aren't aware of, aware of it? I think gaming is a great example of that. You know, we, we we hear a lot of people say, oh, the metaverse is just crazy. Why would I use it? Why would I spend time? No one wants to spend time in those digital environments. And then you look at the gaming world, which is, you know, the gaming technology is what powers the metaverse, right? It's just a different name for basically a, a use case for gaming technologies that transcends games. And you have 3 billion people that play games every single day. Um, so, you know, that, that Generation Z, that Generation Alpha that I mentioned, this is their TV. This is how they hang out. My little cousins, you know, go and meet on Fortnite and they use it as a social network. They don't necessarily play games. They meet together and they have fun and they, they walk alongside each other in this virtual world. So the fact that, you know, gaming has already proven all of that, to me, that's uh, that just shows that the metaverse is already here, just under a different name. So, you know, if, if by, by that, um, by that assumption, you know, that's the future is already here. It's called gaming and uh, it's going to soon be rolled up into metaverse, um, you know, merge with blockchain. But the actual behavior of spending time in a digital environment and spending money there has been proven for the last 20 years by the gaming industry. Yes, I, uh, I very much agree with you there, Sam. Like I, I have a, I have a, a son. He is, he's just turned 12 years old. But um, <laughs> yeah, I mean, then he, you definitely understand. Exactly. Um, don't even need to explain it. Everyone understands, I think. Um, let's start to finish this off, Sam. Um, Formula One. Who wins next year, and why? What do you see as the kind of the, the trajectory of, of of the teams at the moment? Damn. Well, I mean, this year was the, the year with the big changes. Every time a big change happens, whether it's aerodynamics or engine, there is a big shakeup. It happened to Mercedes and they won for seven years straight. Now, Red Bull obviously was the, the stronger team this year. So, you know, it's, it's very possible that they end up winning next year as well. I think over time, you'll see all the teams getting closer and then you'll be a new change of regulation. So um, my, you know, my emotional bet would be on Mercedes, um, but realistic bet might still be on Red Bull. Very diplomatically said. All right. And finally, Sam, what is your favorite science fiction book, film or TV show? Oh, that's a great question. Um, I've been, you know, it's it's not nothing um, exceptional, but I've been uh, raised with Star Wars and I think those still occupy a pretty special place for me so I'll go with that yeah all right can't can't argue with the uh the nostalgic power of uh, the Star Wars universe yes indeed yeah sorry uh, that's an obvious one nothing uh probably it's disappointed right. a few people there but <laughs> all right um hey really fun talking to you today Sam thank you for coming on the show um yeah hey close it out again you know tell people where they can find you on twitter or linkedin or wherever else you like to hang out and again where people should go to uh dig in to what you guys are building with land vault yeah just find me at sam huber uh s-a-m-h-u-b-e-r on twitter on uh linkedin uh instagram and uh, you can follow me from there. And then landvault.io is uh, is the company. And hopefully we can help you also build your presence in the metaverse. Awesome. Thank you very much, Sam. All the best and bye for Thanks, now. Thanks, Andy. All right, there you go. That was Sam from Landvault. Yeah, fascinating guy. Um, yeah, I mean, obviously very smart guy. Anyone who has spent time as an F1 engineer and for Mercedes, man, working directly with Lewis Hamilton. Um, 
a few years ago, but man, that is, uh, that's quite a story. Incredible. So, um, yeah. Do you guys watch F1? I've, um, yeah, I'm a, I'm a recently, reasonably recent convert to F1, but I watched all of the season last year and, uh, all of the season, uh, this year, um, I guess I was backing Max at Red Bull and and Charles at, at Ferrari, mainly because my partner, she's a, a massive Lewis Hamilton Mercedes fan. So you just had to kind of take the tr- contrarian bit. But um, over time, <laughs> that turned out to be the right one. So anyway, yeah, shout out to the F1 crew. Um, shout out to Sam. Thanks for coming on the show. Land Vault looks, looks cool. Looks fascinating. Uh, link will be in the show notes, but of course the website again is landvault.io. And I think we come to the end of the show. Uh, so thanks for listening. If you enjoyed the show, make sure you subscribe to the crypto conversation. So, you know, when each new episode drops, uh, but that is it for today. Thanks for listening team. This was the crypto conversation for brave and new coins here.